Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. I'd like to welcome you to The Gary Knoll Show. Well, how often have you said, gee, I wished I could change? And I'm saying, watch today's program and you're on your way. Change your life. Coming at you right now. It was the early 1970s and a Professor Bruce Lipton was doing some unusual work. He had taken the DNA, or the gene, out of cells. Now what he found that was remarkable and that would virtually revolutionize science was that the cell continued to do what it was supposed to do, but there was no gene there telling it what to do. That'd be like you having your brain removed and carrying on a conversation or going about your work. It wasn't possible. And he replicated again, and it still came up that way. Recently, I had a conversation with uh, Professor Lipman, and I asked him, I said, what do you think caused this? And he said, at the moment that this happened, I didn't know. And my colleagues simply couldn't accept this out at Stanford University. So he had to go into another discipline. He had to go into quantum physics, and from there into Buddhism and existential beliefs before he would come up with an answer of how can the cell understand what to do if the basic programming is gone. Well, what he found was, and what has taken a long time for people to accept, and many still don't accept, is that it is the medium in which that cell existed that caused it to respond. I'm Gary Nall. In our program, we're going to explore what about the medium in which you exist, your beliefs, your attitudes, your actions, your emotions. You wake up one day and you're 30, you're 40, you're 50, 60, 70, or getting there or there slightly over and you're wondering, what am I doing? Because it's generally only at, at these decades that we begin to re-examine our life. It's almost like New Year's, New Year's, we're going to start all over, have new resolutions. Well, then about May, we think, haven't done anything, started and stopped. And then it's the same old, same old. I believe that we can understand a lot about human nature by combining science and beliefs, put them all together and see what do we have. And I'm going to take a little different approach than what you might expect. I'm going to ask you to start this whole process by looking at what would happen if you emptied your life. And that's our theme, emptying your life. What does it mean to empty your life in order to better understand what your life could be, who you are, and think of all the mistakes you've made, think of all the things that if you've just been stymied by, and what can you put in its place? Well, what we try to do in our society is instead of emptying anything, we add something in. We're almost afraid to accept that that maybe if we stopped long enough, got quiet, faced our problems, tried to understand the lesson of them, that we would have to surrender a lot of our beliefs. And almost everything you do every day is based upon your beliefs. What if your beliefs are wrong? What if a part of your beliefs are wrong? What if something in your belief system should have been changed and you didn't change it? I'm helping a group of individuals at each decade of life, those who are at 30 to 70, men and women, and all I'm doing is asking them a series of questions. And over a six-month period, these individuals are using these questions as the basis for making changes in their life. And to see what is the result if you can focus on some issues and come up with some new ideas. So I'm going to go through some questions. Not that I'm going to have the answer. I'm merely going to open the door. But what's nice about opening doors, just like Dr. Lipton did, he showed that Pay attention, science, but all of science disagreed with him. All of it. Why? Why couldn't everyone simply say, wow, we have a whole new way of looking at things? Because they were so rigidified, they were so collectively indoctrinated into the dogma, the ritual, the creed, the belief that what they had been told and what their subconscious was processing was real. But he showed it wasn't. Now here's one man saying, look at the milieu, look at the medium, 
And if he had looked back in the 1800s, there was a man named Beecham who was Pasteur's uh, contemporary, and where Pasteur was saying, it is the microbe that causes disease, Beecham was saying, no, it's the medium that the microbe exists in that causes disease. No one paid attention to Beecham. At the time, no one paid attention to, to Dr. Lipton, even to this day. We have, we're still focusing on the gene, the gene, the gene. Everything's in your gene. If the gene says you're going to be uh, dying at a certain age or if you're going to have cancer, look at how many women had their breasts removed because doctor says, hmm, you've got the gene that predicts you're going to get breast cancer. Completely healthy women with nothing wrong with their breasts went in and had their doctors remove their breasts, remove their daughter's breasts because they were told, you've got the gene. That is how really distorted the whole science of genetics has become. But it's only a symptom of the larger distortion of reality of our entire society. Let's begin our journey. For all of you of every decade and in between, let's do something a little different. In the process of emptying our life, so we take everything out to see what works. Have you ever just one day gone to your sock drawer and taken all your socks out and see which ones match and don't match and, and you think, wow, I've got all this stuff in here that doesn't match and then you throw it away? And there's a part of you that doesn't want to throw anything away. I mean, look in your closets, look in your garage and your attics and your basement, look at all the stuff we just accumulate. Look at the people we accumulate. Look at all the things we accumulate that serves no useful purpose. We have a hard time surrendering things because so much of our identity is based upon collecting things. We collect degrees and money and possessions and friends because that's what we become. We become an extension of everything we collect. But do we ever stop and say, what is the total sum of my world and the relevance of it from what I've collected? Are you a better person, a wiser person, a more humane person, a kinder person? Are you a more empathetic person based upon what you collect? What if you emptied out everything and then only put back into your life what serves the essential self? But how do we know what's essential when part of what we collect is our identity? How many times have you gone through every moment of every day doing as best as you can, working as hard as you can, only to realize, I'm still empty. I, I'm, I don't feel that completeness. If I'm working this hard, I ought to feel better about myself. I recently saw a film called Being Julia uh, with Annette Bening. And there's a point in the film where this famous actress, this British actress, that's what she's playing, and her husband, a producer uh, of, of, of theater, uh, is having an affair with a younger man, a friend of her son. And she kind of accepts that her husband shouldn't know about it, but if he does, you know, well, they're kind of modern. And then she realizes that everything she was going through to both have this man in her life, and then when he no longer wanted to be a part of it, to show her distress of not having was all just part of her acting. Her whole life was just acting. Everything was an illusion. Everything in her life was an illusion. And I thought about how many people I know that all they do every day is Play act. The doctor who says, we're here to help you, and kills you. Well, that's play acting. <laughs> and, and the curtain is, your life is gone, <laughs> or you're injured. You look at how many people die each year because of bad medicine, it's uh, conservatively the number one cause of death in America. More people die each year, 786,000, because of bad medicine than all other causes out there. But no one says, change the script. Stop acting like you want to help someone and look at the results of what you do. But we won't do that. We'd rather look at the effort that we put into something than the results from that effort. So we reward ourselves with effort. I work hard at my job. I want to help people. But are you helping people? Yes or no? All you rheumatologists, do you have a cure for arthritis? The answer is no. But what did you give people? Minimum. 55,000 dead people from Vioxx, Celebrex. How many drugs have you given with absolute certainty they should work and never looked at the fact of all these dead bodies? 
50,000 Americans one year die malnutrition from going into a hospital. They got the malnutrition in the hospital. Did any dietitian, nu nutritionist, nurse, or doctor say, hmm, what are we doing wrong here? Should we do something different? No, they say, we did everything we had to do. Yeah, but the patient died. Well, but that's not our fault. We were following the script, just like, just like Annette Benning. Her script for her life was all just acting. How many people act sincere and aren't? We elect presidents based upon the level of their sincerity. And don't ask, okay, so the guy's sincere, but what, what about the consequences of his actions? How many people are alive or dead because of it? We are so caught up into the mystique that life is simply what we should accept that we never question whether or not what we're accepting is real. So how I would suggest that we start our first step is select everything as if you were starting over. Now what would change? Well, when I go into someone's refrigerator, when I went into my brother's refrigerator, um, I immediately closed the door. I think there were <laughs> organisms in there that were the CDC could not kill. And they were living in the food that my brother had. Now, my brother's not that unusual. I'm sure many other Americans have things that when you smile in the refrigerator, something smiles back and shouldn't. <laughs> and, oh, dirty you can't imagine. What do you mean? So it's a little dirt. Won't hurt you? Yeah, it will. Well, it didn't hurt me. Well, you've got cancer. How do you know it didn't hurt you? Well, that didn't come from cigarette smoking. It didn't? No. Clean out everything and then start over. Think of your wardrobe. What would change? If you just cleaned it out and say, I want a whole new wardrobe. I used to drive my friends uh, to despair because every two years I would completely redo all the furnishings in my apartment. I had a large Upper West Side Manhattan apartment and uh, I would do different styles. Why are you changing, Gary? Well, because I'm bored with what I had and part of the excitement of life is creating something new. Yeah, but it's a lot of effort. Of course it's effort. But you know what is more effort? Trying to adapt to something that's boring. Look at your sex life. Boring. Look at your conversation. Real boring. Right? Look at almost everything in our lives. Now, am I right? And then we adapt to it, and we just kind of, well, another day, another dollar, and i got to eat the same things, go to the same thing, talk, mm -hmm, same conversations, right? Well, start over. Start over and say, I'm going to have a different kind of conversation, one that's going to be surprising. I actually want to have meaningful conversations. Ooh. <laughs> a meaningful conversation? Wow. Well, that would eliminate a lot of conversations, wouldn't it? Yeah. Most conversations, because they're not meaningful. Now, why aren't they meaningful? Because we don't see the purpose of a meaningful conversation, because it means we have to talk about something, and we have to first select something as meaningful, and then look at it as if there's a way of changing it. If you're not willing to change something, you're not going to focus on it, are you? A fear of knowing is a fear of doing, so said Fritz Perl, the discoverer of Gestalt. That means if we don't want to change something, we won't look for it to change. So everything in your life, select it as if this is a new day, something fresh and vital. From the color of the clothes we wear, to the type of friends that we have, to what we do with those friends, and what we do with ourselves. Even your bodies. How many people do I know? How many men going through andropause from 40 on up? They're losing muscle mass. They're, uh, they're losing their sense of energy and enthusiasm. Their passion for things are gone. They're even losing their rear end, their gluteus. It, it does. Look at, look, look at most men in their 20s. Their, their gluteus is round and solid. Then look at men, every decade it gets smaller and smaller, till then it's a pancake. It's flat. Flat rear ends. And that's why so many guys just fall into toilets. <laughs> and that's embarrassing. I mean, what do you do when you're kind of, your legs are up in the air and you're, help, get me out. It can happen. <laughs> but then ask that guy, okay, what kind of body we'd want? And where their mind's going to go is not what kind of body I'd like to have, what kind of mind I'd like to have is, well, what kind of effort is it going to take? Oh, it's going to take an effort. It's not going to be easy. Well, if it's too hard, if it's going to disrupt me, if it's going to make me uncomfortable, I can't do it. So you, the level of your comfort determines 
your reality. So you've adapted everything to a low level of discomfort. So the moment a conversation is uncomfortable, you become defensive. The moment you're supposed to do something to change to grow, you, you back off. The older we get, as each decade approaches, the less we focus upon what we need to do to change. We start focusing upon, I can't go back, I'm never going to be as young, as attractive, as accepted, as passionate. So I just got to kind of squeeze my life into an ever narrow frame of existence. So I'll hang with people who are like me, and I'll exclude everyone who's not. And so your life goes from here to here, and you just adapt to it. That's the problem of what we do when we age. Next up, when you need someone special and someone to be special, everything then becomes an edited illusion. Think of how many times that the basis of whatever you do is because you project upon another person your own incompleteness, your own insecurity, your needs. And then everything that should be noticed about a person, you have to edit out because it doesn't meet your, the special person. So all these other deficiencies, all these other qualities that should be looked at and challenged, you kind of don't pay attention to because you're needing something special. Think of the politicians that we need to be strong and we look, overlook all their other deficiencies. Think of the school teacher who is biased. Think of the people who are prejudiced. And because we need something from them, we exclude any uh, real critiquing. Instead of looking carefully and saying, if I need someone special out there, it's because I don't feel special in here. For every deficiency you have, you're merely going to look at another person to fill up that deficiency. Well, who out there is special enough to fill the void in your life? No one. And all that's going to happen when you go on that route is you're going to waste a lot of your life expecting someone else to make you feel the way you should make yourself feel. And when they can't do it, that's when the arguments start. Next, how do you compensate for feelings of inadequacy? Never fully relaxing, always feeling vulnerable, never wanting to let yourself go, never truly being in the moment, always planning everything, always having to control everything. That's what happens when we feel inadequate. Almost always we will compensate for inadequacy. And when we compensate for any place we feel inadequate, we're really feeling vulnerable. We hope someone doesn't find our vulnerability. So we protect our vulnerabilities. We disguise them. And the older we get, as each generation comes, we throw more levels of insulation around our deficiencies. And then we only focus upon what we know will not embarrass us, that we can do with some sense of completeness. And so we kind of hide there, least off anyone finds where we're inadequate. And we'll compensate. Some people feel so vulnerable because of their inadequacy, they overeat. Or they drink, or gamble, or spend time distracted in something. They don't even try to hide it anymore. And other people are very good at hiding their deficiencies. Well, I want to ask you, how do you grow? by just promoting what you can do well, or by eliminating what you can't, and then balancing your life in a more complete way. We have a lot of people, everybody, in fact, does something well. Everybody. I don't care if it's shining shoes, or cutting hair, or making missiles, or broadcasting the news. Everybody has mastered something. But what about the rest of their life? Where is the balance in their life? Without balance, you're imbalanced. And when you're imbalanced, then everything is going to be distorted. It is the imbalance and distortion that causes disharmony. Disharmony leads to disease. Stress comes from what we cannot handle. So that anything that is considered a stressful situation is because we can't handle the outcome of it, so we feel vulnerable to the consequences of it. And when you feel vulnerable that you're going to have a negative consequence, then you stress yourself, and then what you fear, you actually manifest. 
What's missing from your life? What's missing? Now, more importantly, what's missing and how does it affect you? To know what's missing from your life, you have to take the time to go into that conscious focus, mindful meditation, being present in the moment and saying, I'm going to be mindful of what I ideally would like in my life. And my ideals are that in my friendship, this is the kind of friend I want, the kind of body I want, the health I want, the career I want, the quality of time for self or others that I want where I'd like to live, and you write down all of the things that you feel are very important to you that viscerally, from your heart, from your heart chakra, you feel that connection to the essential energy. You say, this is what I want, and then honor that. But now, if you have what you want here and what you actually have here, if there's a discrepancy, that creates conflict because everyone who has a desire for A but is living at C is going to feel the rub. Every day you're going to be reminded that you're not living your ideal. Now you can do one of two things. You can either A, change, so you can at least have a chance of manifesting your ideal, or adapt to the pain of not having an ideal. It's going to be one or the other. That's how we have a life, not allowing other people to inform us what we should be doing to be happy. Inform yourself, this is what I want, this is what I'm going to do, here's the tools I need, here's my plan of action, and then don't let anything distract you. Do you possess all the resources and openness to change and grow? Because to grow, you have to have resources to grow. You have to have time to grow, and time can't be on an artificial schedule. There is a natural process that occurs. If you try to force it, try to get into shape too quickly, you're going to injure yourself. Train too hard, you're going to injure yourself. Study too hard, you'll injure your brain by being stressed. Look at how many college students are really stressed out because they're on methamphetamine or cocaine. Uh, or caffeine, staying up all night to cram for something because they expected, they're expected to have so much knowledge in too short a period of time. It is not natural, nor is it natural for a doctor in residency to work 35 hours. Would you want a doctor operating on you when they haven't slept in 35 hours? No. Why do we put them through that? That's a macabre ritual. That's a hazing, a medical hazing. We do the same for nurses. We do the same for other people. Slow down to the speed of life. Focus with a sense of complete attention and say, how much time is it going to take to get where I need to go and learn to accept that it is a process that cannot be rushed, nor is it a process that should be delayed. Delaying is procrastination. It is diversion. Look to see how clever your mind is in distracting yourself from where you need to go. Look at how clever the excuses are that you say, I don't have the tools, therefore I can't do something, instead of saying, what tools do I need? Let me, let me get those tools. One or the other is going to happen. You're either going to go forward or you're going to stay still. You stay still, watch how you adapt to staying still, and it's always a negative adaptation. Bitterness, anger, a sense of self-righteous indignation at the world because you're not you're not happy, they're happy. You blame everything and circumstances. Well, if only, if only what? If only you were rich, or only you were black, or only you're white, or taller, or shorter, smarter, or not. No, those are not what's causing you to have a happy life. Those are immaterial to a happy life. But we've made them material. I know a whole group of people who run a radio station who feel that they are victims of everyone else and therefore are entitled to their anger. And then I'll show you people who says, if I'm a victim, I've made myself a victim. I choose not to be a victim. I choose to be free. I choose to be free to create my own life, my own sense of happiness, my own sense of completeness. You're not responsible for how I feel. You don't give me a headache. If I have a headache, it's because I've chosen a headache. It's just a distraction from my frustration of being overwhelmed by stress that I have maladapted to. 
And we are a nation that feels like victims, aren't we? We actually ritualize being victims. We enshrine victimhood in our society. Haven't helped the person who says, while you're all still playing victim, I have surrendered the need for any form of redemption through suffering. I am complete in the moment of my own consciousness. Remember what Lipton said, it's not the gene, and the gene is the circumstance. It's not the teaching, and a whole nation thrives in the recovery movements, recovering your memory, and teaching you about your mommy and daddy, and you weren't breastfed, or you were yelled at, and hence you locked it into your psychology of self, and it's in, buried in the subconscious. We're going to dig every week two or three times, and you're going to be better and better looking into your deep self, and we're going to probe in there like we're going to be emotional anthropologist. And when we finally find something in there, we're going to examine it like medical archaeologists. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. I'd like to welcome you to The Gary Knoll Show. This is the place to come to if you want programs you're just not going to see anywhere else. I can promise you at the end of this program you're going to have insights and information that will stimulate constructive thought and change. Without balance, you're imbalanced. And when you're imbalanced, then everything is going to be distorted. It is the imbalance and distortion that causes disharmony. Disharmony leads to disease. Stress comes from what we cannot handle. So that anything that is considered a stressful situation is because we can't handle the outcome of it, so we feel vulnerable to the consequences of it. And when you feel vulnerable that you're going to have a negative consequence, then you stress yourself, and then what you fear, you actually manifest. What's missing from your life? What's missing? Now, more importantly, what's missing and how does it affect you? To know what's missing from your life, you have to take the time to go into that conscious focus, mindful meditation, being present in the moment and saying, I'm going to be mindful of what I ideally would like in my life. And my ideals are that in my friendship, this is the kind of friend I want the kind of body I want, the health I want, the career I want, the quality of time for self or others that I want, where I'd like to live. And you write down all of the things that you feel are very important to you that viscerally, from your heart, from your heart chakra, you feel that connection to the essential energy. You say, this is what I want, and then honor that. But now if you have what you want here and what you actually have here, if there's a discrepancy, that creates conflict. Because everyone who has a desire for A but is living at C is going to feel the rub. Every day you're going to be reminded that you're not living your ideal. Now you can do one of two things. You can either A, change, so you can at least have a chance of manifesting your ideal, or adapt to the pain of not having an ideal. It's going to be one or the other. That's how we have a life. Not allowing other people to inform us what we should be doing to be happy. Inform yourself. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. Here's the tools I need. Here's my plan of action. And then don't let anything distract you. Do you possess all the resources and openness to change and grow? Because to grow, you have to have resources to grow. You have to have time to grow, and time can't be on an artificial schedule. There is a natural process that occurs. If you try to force it, try to get into shape too quickly, you're going to injure yourself. Train too hard, you're going to injure yourself. Study too hard, you'll injure your brain by being stressed. Look at how many college students are really stressed out because they're on methamphetamine or cocaine uh, or caffeine, staying up all night to cram for something because they expected, they're expected to have so much knowledge in too short a period of time. It is not natural, nor is it natural for a doctor in residency to work 
35 hours. Would you want a doctor operating on you when they haven't slept in 35 hours? No. Why do we put them through that? That's a macabre ritual. That's a hazing, a medical hazing. We do the same for nurses. We do the same for other people. Slow down to the speed of life. Focus with a sense of complete attention and say, how much time is it going to take to get where I need to go and learn to accept that it is a process that cannot be rushed, nor is it a process that should be delayed. Delaying is procrastination. It is diversion. Look to see how clever your mind is in distracting yourself from where you need to go. Look at how clever the excuses are that you say, I don't have the tools, therefore I can't do something, instead of saying, what tools do I need? Let me, let me get those tools. One or the other is going to happen. You're either going to go forward or you're going to stay still. You stay still, watch how you adapt to staying still. And it's always a negative adaptation. Bitterness, anger, a sense of self-righteous indignation at the world because you're not happy, you're not happy, they're happy. You blame everything and circumstances. Well, if only, if only what? If only you were rich or only you were black or only you're white or taller or shorter, smarter or not. No, those are not what's causing you to have a happy life. Those are immaterial to a happy life. But we've made them material. I know a whole group of people who run a radio station who feel that they are victims of everyone else and therefore are entitled to their anger. And then I'll show you people who says, if I'm a victim, I've made myself a victim. I choose not to be a victim. I choose to be free. I choose to be free to create my own life, my own sense of happiness, my own sense of completeness. You're not responsible for how I feel. You don't give me a headache. If I have a headache, it's because I've chosen a headache. It's just a distraction from my frustration of being overwhelmed by stress that I have maladapted to. And we are a nation that feels like victims, aren't we? We actually ritualize being victims. We enshrine victimhood in our society. Heaven help the person who says, while you're all still playing victim, I have surrendered the need for any form of redemption through suffering. I am complete in the moment of my own consciousness. Remember what Lipton said, it's not the gene, and the gene is the circumstance. It's not the teaching, and a whole nation thrives in the recovery movements, recovering your memory, and teaching you about your mommy and daddy, and you weren't breastfed, or you were yelled at, and hence you locked it into your psychology of self, and it's buried in the subconscious. We're going to dig every week, two or three times, and you're going to be better and better looking into your deep self, and we're going to probe in there like, we're going to be emotional anthropologist. And when we finally find something in there, we're going to examine it like medical archaeologists. We're going to dust it and brush it and blow it off and say, hmm, there it is. You see? You didn't go to the bathroom when you should have, when you were eight years old, and you held it in, and now you hold all your emotions. And the person goes, oh, thank God you understand me. I was afraid I was going to have to understand myself. Gee, isn't it nice to be a nation of educated neurotics, psychotics, delusional, paranoid schizophrenics? Because that's what everyone's got to label. Everybody is a disease today. Can't talk with a stranger? Ah, stranger disease. <laughs> Afraid of growing up? Oh, yes. Another disease. We have just a disease for everything. Everything. You talk too much? A disease. Don't talk enough? It's a disease. Don't talk in the right tone? It's a disease. Confrontational, attitudinal disease. Oh my God, it's perfect. The whole nation is a disease needing a cure. And who cures you? A whole profession. It says, yes, I'm Dr. Luckety Schmuck, and I'll tell you what's wrong with you. And we buy into it instead of saying, hold on a second. I'm present right now, and there's nothing wrong with me right now. So I'm going to make my choice from where I am now. My energy, the energy of my being can say I can do what I want to do now. If I try to go back into my past and try to rearrange my past and correct everything in my past, that would take a whole other lifetime. 
So if you're 40, another 40 years. Your therapists say, great, <laughs> yeah. But that's not going to help you. You can't change the past, can you? So why not just be present for where you're at? Look ahead, not back. Distraction diminishes the present moment. Just eliminate distractions. I saw today that the average person is now watching television almost six hours. How much time do you use in a day to distract yourself? Think of all the phone calls that are meaningless. Think of the chores. Think of the rituals. Why not just say anything that distracts me from what I need to balance my life, I'm not going to engage anymore? Take all distractions away. And what are you left with? Just you. So are you really afraid of you? What would happen with just you? Try to talk with a kid today about themselves. They can tell you about their family, and they can tell you about what they're doing, but it's hard for them to talk about themselves. A lot of people can't talk about themselves because they don't know who they are. That's the distraction factor. We're even uncomfortable watching someone meditate. What do they think about? Hmm, how can they sit there that long? I couldn't sit there that long. I get fidgety. I could sit there if I had headset on, listening to music, talking in the other ear with the telephone, watching a video game, and playing my computer. No, I could do it. But that's not meditation, is it? No. Just being present and saying, no more distractions. Anything that distracts you, you've created as a very useful tool to keep from making transitions. Change cannot come without risk. Anytime you're going to change, you're going to have to face all the other things in your life that are attached to what you're changing. Think how many times you want to do something different and first you had to get the approval of others. And why is it we feel we always have to get approval for everything? What is it that someone's going to say to us? Yeah, go ahead and take that class. Take that vacation. But what if we said we wanted to do something that they wouldn't expect, like you're a lawyer and you're successful and you say, I'd, I'd like to go out to New Mexico and, uh, and spend time with nature and uh, do what? Nothing. Yeah, yeah, but you're a $300 an hour. I know, but do nothing with that hour. Charge nothing for that hour. Just commune with nature. They're going to think you need help. So ask yourself, are you more afraid of the contentions and confrontation that come when you're seeking others' approval for change rather than the change itself? If you want to be healthy, why should there be an argument about it? If you're sick and seeking an alternative therapy, why should your doctor say, no, you can't have a second opinion or a third opinion or an alternative opinion? Why should they be concerned? And why should you allow yourself not to have extra opinions if you're seeking something that is allowing you a chance to look at your choices and grow? And that's exactly what we do. We limit our choices to those who give us certainty that their understanding of us is enough for us to make a decision on their say-so. Well, think how many times in life people vote or eat or dress or work based upon what others say is best for them. It takes an attitude that I'm willing to face this risk to make this change. We need to see something for what it is. Only then are you ready for true healthy change. If I keep looking at something and trying to distort it, trying to make it over, and trying to re re repackage it, reframe it, refocus it, because what it is is not acceptable, then all I'm doing is playing the game of manipulating illusions. And what we frequently do is what we feel uncomfortable about, that we can't change, we simply avoid or we put a pretty face on it until one day we wake up and say, why am I doing this? Look at something for what it is. Just look at it. What is it? 
Visualize yourself standing over something and looking down at it, unattached to it. Now, what is it? What is it that I'm seeing? Why are these two nations fighting? Why are these people killing each other? Why are these people refusing to see if there's any virtue or value in what the other person has to share? When you're a part of either side, you can't do that because you can't see something for what it is. Whether it's the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, they can't see the value of each other. Or the in Northern Ireland, or the Tutsis and the Hutu, look at all the people who are in conflict, even Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals. Think of all the different ways that we have excluded what could have helped us had we just been honest and said, see it for what it is. I don't have to attach to it. I merely want to see it and see if there's value in it. That's like listening non-judgmentally. What if I listen to someone without the need to correct them or to find fault with them? Just let them say what they have to say and I bear witness to what they're saying. Think if Dr. Lipton had had people around him at Stanford at the time when he said, it's not the gene, it is the milieu, it is the energy from the medium around it. What do you think would have happened to all of science from that day in the 1970s till now? We would have had some humanistic quantum leaps forward. That's the consequence of not listening non-judgmentally. That means in almost everything we listen to, we listen as a reactionary. We're baited. We have minefields. Trouble is, no one knows where your minefield is. When you're talking with someone, you don't say, no, you realize, if, if you say this, I'm going to react. If, if you do this, I'm going to react. No one knows this, do they? And then we, oh, why'd you say that? And we react. We have thousands upon thousands of emotional minefields buried in our psyche. Instead of just clearing it all off by saying, whatever is said, I'm not going to react to it. I'm going to use reason. Then think of all the arguments we wouldn't have had. Think of all the uh, problems of stressing ourselves we wouldn't have done. That's what happens when you clear out the minefields that have been planted throughout our life. Being free to be in the moment allows you to do that. Being present in the moment allows you to do that. If people write me an email and, and say hateful things, I just read it and delete it. Why? Because I know it's not about me. It's about them. Do you realize how many days I have had perfect days because I chose not to get upset about what someone said? And think how many times you've gotten upset because someone says, something about you, and you took it personally. You believed it. Now try to argue logically against something that is illogical. You can't do it, can you? And that's what we do. We try to bring reason and logic to something that's not, instead of just surrendering it. Surrender the need to convince someone that you're a nice person. Surrender the need to prove that you're a, a happy person and a loving person. You don't have to prove anything to anyone. And yet, think how much time we do, where we live, the work we do, the earning capacity, where we send our kids. We're broadcasting right now from the Upper East Side of Manhattan. There's a lot of wealthy people in this neighborhood. Do you know how many of their kids are already at age two and three being prepared for the difficult tasks of life ahead and being taught different courses and being groomed? What's missing in that is being a kid. So who's this kid doing this for? Themselves and their future? Or for the insecurity of the parent? That's what happens when we react. We need to see something in a different way. And the way we do that is learn the lesson of your crisis. And in every crisis we have, there is a lesson. Let me give you an example. There is a woman I know who is approaching 40 and for the last year had a person staying with her who was in the kind of the peace movement, an activist, but this person was stressed and would frequently blow off the handle about, you know, this person gives me no privacy and is very jealous and every place I go, this person wants to know where I was and, and, and then in the next breath would say, but this person, you know, 
where would he go and what would he do if, you know, if, if he left? And, and I said, well, why don't you just ask him what he intends to do with his life? And that really has nothing to do with your life. And what do you intend to do with your life? You're not having a, a, a relationship with him. He's just, he's the man who came to dinner. He just never leaves. And she says, I know, but, and then I started realizing this woman gets a lot of her sense of self by the people that she tries to take home and, and recover. She needs to be needed. Why? Because a lot of her belief was that her value as a human being is in who she can save. Yeah, but these people ask to be saved. And look at the results. Are they actually growing and changing? If you have someone staying with you for a year and you're taking yoga, meditation, and nature outings, and they're no different. Nothing, look carefully. They haven't changed in a year. They just got free room and board and free meal and, and hanging out. And, but telling you about comrades, you know, we must be against the establishment. Well, let them go out and and be self-supportive because she's between two worlds. Anger at her loss of freedom and autonomy and, and yet needing over here to show that what well, she's caring and nurturing. But what are the results to her? Merely refortifying an old belief system and for him, doesn't help him. He doesn't change. So what happens then is she looks at every person, every man, that she can only associate with a man if she has a deep, meaningful communication. And I said, well, these people want that? People ask for that? Someone come up and say, I can only speak with you if it's going to be a deep, meaningful conversation. If only you can show me you love me and care for me and want to be forever with me, can we have this conversation? Otherwise, you're using me, taking advantage of me. That's how our mind thinks. Imagine that. And as smart as this person is, she couldn't see that in herself. And when I just suggested, take a look at what you're really doing with these relationships and whose interest is it serving. All this yoga, all this meditation, all these retreats, at what point do you say, I've learned my lesson, let me go forward? Because you're right back to the beginning like a whole lot of effort, watching someone just work, 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 and then you look and you take a real good look, and they're, they're not moving. They're not going anywhere. Never get to the point where you confuse a person's efforts and the illusion of that effort with the reality of change. When a person's changing, it is effortless. Change is effortless. Holding back from change is the effort. Watch someone who's really changing. They are fluid and flowing. Watch the people who are trying to convince themselves in you that they want to change. They're huffing and puffing emotionally and spiritually and psychically and doing everything. They're just like in a, in a supermarket, a spiritual supermarket. They have a big uh, shopping basket and they're taking a little bat of D-Pack and Tony Robbins and they're going to take this and what's that and reach up there and get down there and throw it on the bag and they get out and they say, I've got everything in here. Do you realize how much I've done? I've done all this. Are you happy? No! Where's the next aisle? <laughs> it's not about filling up from out there. It's about emptying out everything and realizing, stop trying to prove yourself. Flow. Effort. Let the energy flow. When energy flows, you're freeing yourself. Watch any great athlete. They move with such ease. And then watch the person's tight. They're slower. Another important area is when we learn the lesson of every one of our crises, then we can grow. Until you learn the lesson of your crisis, you will not grow. Until the doctor realizes that the idea and object of the exercise is not to treat the patient, but to heal the patient. Therapy is not healing. Therapy is a structured form of intellectual disciplines applied to a problem. As long as you're giving everything that you know is supposed to work, you feel you've done what you're supposed to do. And therefore you can live with yourself, even if every patient gets worse or dies. Healing is a completely different understanding. Healing says, 
let us look at the whole person. Let's look at what it is that's keeping them that way. If I have someone sitting in front of me who's grossly obese, I'm not at all interested in the fat that's on their body. I'm interested in the mindset that allowed that fat to get on the body. The mindset that has to be dealt with. It is the circumstances that are choices because nobody gets that kind of weight accidentally. You don't get sick in most cases accidentally. You have to do something with either the intent or the negligence that allows it. People don't smoke because they want to die, but they die because they smoke. So where then is the person's sense of self when they're doing something knowing that there's a good possibility they're going to become ill from doing that? When a person is eating calories their body cannot use, foods that are allergic to them, and then taking medications that will not deal with the underlying cause, what allowed that mindset to continue that same illusion? Understand the way someone hurts themselves and why they hurt themselves, and then you learn the lesson. Any lesson you don't learn, you will repeat over and over again. The universe is good to us in that it gives us many lessons. Some are painful, but it also gives us a test with every lesson. And when we can pass the test because we've learned the lesson, then it's a lesson that will save us possibly from ever having to experience that again. Sometimes divorce, bankruptcy, separation, loss is the lesson we've been given. With the pain and suffering that comes with that, there's still a lesson to learn from that. We get angry when these things happen and don't look for how and why they happen. Just what happened and get me out of it. Think of the doctors who treat the patient trying to give a modality when the healing is not a part of the modality. So the patient doesn't understand what caused the illness or infirmary, what caused the problem, only the techniques involved in it. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. I'd like to welcome you to The Gary Knoll Show. A lot of people are at a point where they, they need to change. They've had crisis, they've had problems, and they're finally finding the courage and strength of character to take a step forward. Well, today we're concluding part two of Change Your Life. Let's take a look. Learn the lesson of your crisis. And in every crisis we have, there is a lesson. Let me give you an example. There is a woman I know who is approaching 40 and for the last year had a person staying with her who was in the kind of the peace movement, an activist, but this person was stressed and would frequently blow off the handle about, you know, this person gives me no privacy and is very jealous in every place I go, this person wanted to know where I was and, and, and then in the next breath would say, but this person, you know, where would he go and what would he do if, you know, if, if he left? And, and I said, well, why don't you just ask him what he intends to do with his life, and that really has nothing to do with your life. And what do you intend to do with your life? You're not having a, a, a relationship with him. He's just, he's the man who came to dinner. He just never leaves. And she says, I know, but, and then I started realizing this woman gets a lot of her sense of self by the people that she tries to take home and, and recover. She needs to be needed. Why? Because a lot of her belief was that her value as a human being is in who she can save. Yeah, but these people ask to be saved. And look at the results. Are they actually growing and changing? If you have someone staying with you for a year and you're taking yoga, meditation, and nature outings, and they're no different. Nothing, look carefully. They haven't changed in a year. They just got free room and board and free meal and, and hanging out. And, but telling you about comrades, you know, we must be against the establishment. Well, let them go out and, and be self-supportive because she's between two worlds. Anger at her loss of freedom and autonomy and, and yet needing over here to show that what well, she's caring and nurturing. But what are the results to her? Merely re-fortifying an old belief system and for him, doesn't help him. He doesn't change. So what happens then is she looks at every person every man, that she can only associate with a man if she has a deep, meaningful communication. 
And I said, well, these people want that? People ask for that? Someone come up and say, I can only speak with you if it's going to be a deep, meaningful conversation. If only you can show me you love me and care for me and want to be forever with me, can we have this conversation? Otherwise, you're using me, taking advantage of me. That's how our mind thinks. Imagine that. And as smart as this person is, she couldn't see that in herself. And when I just suggested, take a look at what you're really doing with these relationships and whose interest is it serving? All this yoga, all this meditation, all these retreats, at what point do you say, I've learned my lesson, let me go forward? Because you're right back to the beginning. Like a whole lot of effort, watching someone just work, 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 and then you look and you take a real good look, and they're, they're not moving. They're not going anywhere. Never get to the point where you confuse a person's efforts and the illusion of that effort with the reality of change. When a person's changing, it is effortless. Change is effortless. Holding back from change is the effort. Watch someone who's really changing. They are fluid and flowing. Watch the people who are trying to convince themselves in you that they want to change. They're huffing and puffing emotionally and spiritually and psychically and doing everything. They're just like in a, in a supermarket, a spiritual supermarket. They have a big uh, shopping basket and they're taking a little bit of D-Pack and Tony Robbins and they're going to take this and what's that and reach up there and get down there and throw it on the bag and they get out and they say, I've got everything in here. Do you realize how much I've done? I've done all this. Are you happy? No. Where's the next aisle? <laughs> It's not about filling up from out there. It's about emptying out everything and realizing, stop trying to prove yourself. Flow, effort, let the energy flow. When energy flows, you're freeing yourself. Watch any great athlete. They move with such ease. And then watch the person's tight. They're slower. Another important area is when we learn the lesson of every one of our crises, then we can grow. Until you learn the lesson of your crisis, you will not grow. Until the doctor realizes that the idea and object of the exercise is not to treat the patient, but to heal the patient. Therapy is not healing. Therapy is a structured form of intellectual disciplines applied to a problem. As long as you're giving everything that you know is supposed to work, you feel you've done what you're supposed to do. And therefore you can live with yourself, even if every patient gets worse or dies. Healing is a completely different understanding. Healing says, let us look at the whole person. Let's look at what it is that's keeping them that way. If I have someone sitting in front of me who's grossly obese, I'm not at all interested in the fat that's on their body. I'm interested in the mindset that allowed that fat to get on the body. It is the mindset that has to be dealt with. It is the circumstances that are choices because nobody gets that kind of weight accidentally. You don't get sick in most cases accidentally. You have to do something with either the intent or the negligence that allows it. People don't smoke because they want to die, but they die because they smoke. So where then is the person's sense of self when they're doing something knowing that there's a good possibility they're going to become ill from doing that? When a person is eating calories their body cannot use, foods that are allergic to them, and then taking medications that will not deal with the underlying cause, what allowed that mindset to continue that same illusion? Understand the way someone hurts themselves and why they hurt themselves, and then you learn the lesson. Any lesson you don't learn, you will repeat over and over again. The universe is good to us in that it gives us many lessons. Some are painful, but it also gives us a test with every lesson. And when we can pass the test because we've learned the lesson, then it's a lesson that will save us possibly from ever having to experience that again. Sometimes divorce, bankruptcy, 
Separation, loss, is the lesson we've been given. With the pain and suffering that comes with that, there's still a lesson to learn from that. We get angry when these things happen and don't look for how and why they happen, just what happened and get me out of it. Think of the doctors who treat the patient trying to give a modality when the healing is not a part of the modality. So the patient doesn't understand what caused the illness or infirmary, what caused the problem, only the techniques involved in it. Another issue that's important of people for all areas of life and all decades are approaching, don't wait for loss. Appreciate everything when you have it. I know people that as they're approaching different decades, they start looking with anticipation of what they're losing. Well, I'm hitting 50, and my God, I can never think of myself as young again. I'm hitting 40. Now the gray hair is starting. On, uh, I just talked with a woman who's 49 years of age, and she said that her libido was non-existent for the last year. And I said, well, why? Why do you think? And she said, well, because I'm, I'm 49, Gary. I mean, what guy gets up in the morning and thinks, wow, I really want an, an aging, out-of-shape 49-year-old? Yeah. No, they want young women. They want what I was when I was 25 and sexy and, and fun. But I'm, I'm accepting it. Accepting what? You're accepting that because you're 49, you should no longer have a libido. You should no longer be passionate. You should no longer allow that chi to flow. You should no longer think of all the things you can do. She says, well, yeah. I said, well, then you're going to manifest a very limited life. You're going to you're going to cut the energies of all those things. She says, well, I mean, do you think I'm alone? I said, well, no, you're not alone, but I'll, what if I showed you a woman 49 or 59 or 69 or 79 still actively you know, enjoying their sexuality, still seeking ways to explore it, expand it, enjoy it? She says, well, maybe they're just being immature. Immature? So somehow your belief system says that at a certain age you've got to act your age. So then think of all the other things. You're going to not going to go dancing unless it's to a very conservative dancing, and you're going to dress only conservatively. So what you're saying is that as you approach this decade, everything in your life has to adapt to the preconceived social notion of this decade. So all you're doing is honoring everyone else's beliefs about you at this coming decade. And you've already prepared yourself for it. You're already looking for it. You're looking at the loss that's going to happen as you approach this. How positive is it to think that the next year that you're going to hit 50, that you're going to be less than when you were at 40 or at 45? That's not a mindset that's healthy. So enjoy what you have every day, because if you took away the calendar, if no one knew who you were, then age would only be a number, wouldn't it? What if you lived your life as if age were only a number? and an insignificant number, then you wouldn't adapt to preconceived notions of what you should be doing or not doing at a certain age, right? So don't live your life as if it's important at a particular age. It is not. A whole nation of senior citizens act like senior citizens. Well, we'll go putt golf now, and, but not too strenuous. Don't pull it back too far. We'll exercise just a little bit because we're senior citizens now. No libido for us. <laughs> Can I still chew? I don't have dentures. Hmm, I don't feel accepted. Everyone else has dentures. And diapers. <laughs> God. <laughs> just think of what we do to a whole culture. We minimalize their existence. We say you're no longer relevant. It's all game, but it starts when you accept the rules of it. Break the rules. Just be a living human being who does not care what age you are. Where I grew up, by the time you were 30, you were already supposed to have a family. Uh, and, and be well on into a job that you would work at until you retired. 
There wasn't supposed to be a whole lot of new things. Maybe by 35 you could upgrade things a bit because you could afford them and you were looked upon as a mature part of society. You had to go into the guilds or the different places and be there forever. It was Kiwanis or JCs, and that was always expected. Nobody expected you to do anything different than simply stay the way you were until you died. And you'd go through transitions. At 40, you'd start to really slow down and take it easy. You'd be a coach, but not a player. And expected to have the pot bellies, and expect to have high blood pressure and diabetes and, and heart disease, and expect, you know, to, to have your family grown by that time. And by 50, you're looking at places you can retire to. It's all about, we're going to retire here. And we went to Greece there, and yeah, we've gone five times to the Grand Canyon. Yeah? <laughs> well, where's your life in all that? Oh, we're solid as a rock and about as exciting. <laughs> because people accept where I come from, accept that there's no flexibility in what you're supposed to do. You just you take a card, you read the card, say, hmm, I'm, I'm from this background, I have this income, this education. Okay, punch me in. I'm ready to devote my whole life to this. You're an Italian, live in this neighborhood, you're not supposed to move. We'll make you feel guilt. You know how easy that is? Er, guilt. Oh my God, I'm going to move away, I'm going to move eight blocks. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> Well, it's true, isn't it? Absolutely it's true. And these are the lessons that we have to learn. The greater the fear, the more extreme the reaction. Watch people really get out, bent out of shape because they're just afraid. But they want to acknowledge and say, you know, I'm afraid of learning what you know, so I'm just going to be angry with you. Reactions. The higher the heat of the argument, the more the fear is simply vibrating. Fear constricts, love expands. Openness is where we can see everything. Fear, we can only see limitations. And how many of your thoughts have come from fear? Next, what do you have in abundance? Think of the things we all have in abundance. We have the abundance of people that we can share positive energy with. There's no shortage. The abundance of nature, to enjoy nature. The abundance of, of love to give and receive from our, our little companions, dogs, cats, birds, fish. The abundance of, of energy to focus upon things that we can bring into our life, hobbies, skills, new tools, wonderment of how many things we don't know versus how many we do. What we know even a PhD at a major university, the degree of their knowledge compared to what there is to be knowledgeable about, they have one grain of sand at the bottom of the ocean floor. That's how much they know compared to what it, there is to know. So the abundance of things to learn and to experience. Well, if all these things in life are there for us in abundance, why do we act as if we're paupers emotionally, intellectually, and physically when we live in the abundance of everything that we could embrace? Think on that the next time you start feeling insufficient, incomplete. It's like a person saying, I'm starving, I'm starving. And you say, here's a buffet of 3,000 foods, they're all healthy. But I'm starving, I'm starving. Well, dig in. But I'm starving. Pick it up. Try it. I can't. Why? My belief system doesn't allow me. It's our belief system. Our belief system is our reality. We'd rather starve emotionally and spiritually than in connect with the abundance of energy around us. How do we hide our weaknesses? By overcompensating with our strengths. Look at all the big men on women on Wall Street that took millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars for themselves when their own companies were failing. That is only because they were compensating. Their weaknesses showed no sense of compassion for the shareholders or anyone else. It was greed. 
that shows weakness. So all that opulence was based upon weakness. When a person has to overcompensate by showing you all the things they are, it's from weakness, not strength. That's where looking at something for what it is, you can see that. The need to be right comes from weakness, not strength. Always dominant, weakness, not strength. Always criticizing, weakness, not strength. Always judging others, weakness, not strength. And that's the more, more determined we are, the weaker we are. Because we're covering our fears. Surrender certainty. When I surrender certainty, I begin a step. If I need certainty in order to do anything, I'll never move. That's why science has stayed locked in a paradigm that does not honor true discovery. That's why medicine is locked in a ritualistic display that causes more death than anything else and more injuries than anything else because it's not willing to get out of its certain. Well, show me the double-blind randomized placebo-controlled study done 45 times, and then I'll, I'll do something. It's not willing to surrender the certainty, the need for certainty. So when you surrender the need for certainty, you can take a step. If you're not willing to surrender certainty, you'll stay exactly where you're at. Well, who's going to give you the certainty? Have faith in your own intuition. Take a step. Don't allow others' narrow views and limitations become your narrow views and limitations. Think of all the people who don't believe something is possible, and then you accept them as being right, and then it's not possible. Why don't you seek out people who believe things are possible, and then it is possible? One of the things that we've learned is a reality begins when you visualize it when you focus on it, when you put your energy into seeing something that you want to experience, then it becomes real. And stop the distractions and limitations. Push them out. Every time a distraction comes in, says no. Look at your schedule. A to-do list is the ultimate distraction. A to-do list substitutes for a real life. At the end of a year, how many things on a to-do list have you done and you're no better off because of it? You're no closer to self, but you've got a whole lot of exhaustion from a whole lot of to-do lists marked off. It is not what you achieve on a day-to-day -day level that is relevant because most of what we achieve is irrelevant to who we are. It is merely forms of, of structured distractions. So we have to realize that we're not going to allow anyone's limitations to become ours. And all the people I grew up with, they accept the limitations of how they should look at themselves and life and circumstances, politics and nature, and now they just became a part of it. When you don't accept anyone else's limitations, you're not limited by them. I look at including things in life, not excluding. How can I go from where I'm at to where I need to be? By realizing that I have everything in here that I need to take my step. So if you're approaching or at 60 and you want to feel 60, then you'll feel old. You'll feel less. You'll feel lost. You'll feel that a whole lot of life is behind you, only be remembered by scrapbooks and, and those occasional flashes of inspiration that come to you. Or you can say, I don't care how old I am, and I don't care the circumstances I've accepted. Today, I am focusing my energy in this moment on what I want to experience, and I will then seek out the tools. And for every tool I seek out, I must surrender a tool that no longer works. And surrendering the tools that no longer work surrenders the energy of that. And when you surrender the energy, then the milieu and medium of your life changes, because what you bring in new will become the new energy. And as the new energy comes in and floods over you, you'll feel that excitement of being present for your own existence. When you sacrifice to find meaning, the meaning will have purpose. The fear of sacrificing what you now have means that all you will have is what you've accumulated up to this point. And ask yourself, the total sum of all you've accumulated 
does it represent the blissful peace of mind that you are seeking? Or look at the total of what you've accumulated and say, if I can do it all over, what will I surrender to change the energy? Because when you surrender what no longer works for you, you automatically empty out that energy field to bring new energy in. Whether it's people or ideas, that becomes your new energy. That becomes a new medium. And just like Dr. Lipton, back in the 1970s, when he removed the DNA and the gene, the cell continued to function. We are fully capable of functioning without the structured belief system that says you can only do something because of your beliefs. And I say you can do far more than what your beliefs, and your beliefs could actually be the limitation. Because I am more than my beliefs. I am present for my own creation. And every day I choose to recreate myself over again. In the eyes of myself, not the world. I do not get my view of life through the transparency of their eyes when I can see myself or who I am. It's my eyes, my spiritual eyes, that see my journey ahead. It is my society that sees my journey from behind. Now I'm either going to look ahead or look behind. I'm going to look with my eyes or theirs. Their eyes are going to be aligned and unified. And their strength becomes my weakness because their strength allows me no independence, no autonomy. If I choose to look at life as a medium to which I can surrender and empty out the negative and fill it with the new and the positive, then I'm taking a step that they're not going to take. They will hit 40, 50, 60, and 70 and be angry or depressed or look in a mirror and think woefully what is no longer present. And I will look in the mirror and say, my goodness, look at the potential of what still is. You'll do one or the other. These tools are merely there to help you take that step. And that's what this is about. Do not allow your truth to be distorted by others' bias. My truth works for me. Throughout my life, I've never once felt that I fitted in anywhere. Not once. So instead of trying to remold myself to fit into the very narrow confines, I've chosen instead to expand my consciousness to wherever it would take me. And though there were risks and sacrifices, there was pain and pleasure, at least I know what is possible because my freedom took me to the top of that mountain and I saw the future and their fear keeps them in the valley and all they see is what's immediately in front of them. Think of the difference of what you want to see, what you want to experience, and what you want to do with your life. 